Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. Once in a blue moon, a perfect storm brews. Sometimes literally with floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes, and sometimes figuratively with a series of misfortunes, all building up upon each other. But occasionally, you get a mixture of figuratively and literally. A perfect storm that caused millions to abandon their homes in a mass exodus in search of greener pastures. You get the Great Migration during the Great Depression. You get Okies. But before I tell you how Okies and many others came to be, and how this perfect mixture of misfortune made people pack their bags and seek new beginning, Nick, how are you, and what are you drinking? Drinking some bush light. Doing great. How about yourself? Not too bad. I'm drinking some 10-cup whiskey, and boy, I bet a lot of these people during these times wish they had more whiskey. The time, the setting, the mindset. It is the 1920s in farmland in Midwest and West America. New farmers and generational farmers are having soil problems. Much of the topsoil has been reduced. The monocrops of non-native species has decimated parts of land. The removal of trees and other plant life has caused all natural wind barriers to be gone. The land, the earth, itself is becoming more and more loose. Hardships begin to form as the amount of failing farms grow. Then 1929 rolls around. And the stock market crashes, bringing the market and the economy down with it, causing mass economic turmoil, making it harder for already the hard life of a farmer. The Great Depression has begun. To add on the load of a hard life, in 1931 and 32, a major drought hit the country, mainly in the heartland of the United States. From Texas to the Dakotas, rain became at best sparse. Many of you might be familiar with this event. Its name? The Dust Bowl. This series of hell created the perfect storm, even more dangerous than Sharknado itself. Doubtful. (laughs) The soil in the farming land was already loose from agricultural practices, removal of natural wind barriers, but when you remove water from the equation, aka drought, well, there's really nothing holding the soil to the earth. It's just dust at this point, being taken and pushed around by the wind. That is exactly what happened. The wind pushed all this dry earth into people's homes, businesses, their farm crops, all completely destroyed. With the United States in scrambles from the stock market crash, and now food becoming more and more scarce, a commodity since so many farms were destroyed, the country became desperate. Desperate not for money, not even for work, but desperate to simply stay alive. With people's livelihood destroyed, banks came to collect collect the farms, taking people's homes, and many people were forced to abandon their farms, for they had no hope of growing food in their lifetime. Their land was gone. Towns that formed around people's farms closed shop and became ghost towns. So what do you do when the land does not provide? You have no income coming in, and your belly is empty. You leave. To find work, to find food, to find hope. Like a mass exodus in 1932 and the years to follow, millions of Americans left their homes to travel to find land, to find work, to find a new beginning. Many left the cities, my guess figuring perhaps in their mind that the Great Depression has not hit the cities as hard, so maybe there's work or at least a soup kitchen. Many also left to other farmland, for they heard rumors that the land that the Dust Bowl had not touched. Those people, the people who traveled to other farmlands, who traveled westward, would be the Okies. Okies, a name bestowed by Californians on Midwesterners. Okies, meaning poor white trash. How the turntables, as they say. (laughs) What's the saying? If you just wait long enough, the roles will be reversed. So, you see, Oklahoma got hit some of the hardest by the Dust Bowl. So they had more people leave. Many left to California, where Californians started them started calling them Okies. 
And they didn't just call Oklahomans Okies. They lumped all the Midwest with Oklahomas. A mistake people make to this day. <laughs> I was going to say, like, that's pretty common. Like, like <laughs> you're from Iowa. Is that Indiana? No, 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 no. Now, in California's defense, wow, can't believe I just said that statement, Okies wasn't just used by Californians. Many people escaping the Dust Bowl went to Arizona, Washington, Idaho, Oregon, Alaska, and even Canada. So the term Okies was used up and down the West Coast. And in case anyone was wondering, Oklahoma lost more than 440,000 people due to leaving to find new opportunity, which at the time was a little more than 18% of the entire state's population. But millions of people were leaving their home. 2.5 million people migrated out of the Dust Bowl. So people were coming to cities in different states that governments in these areas tried to start implementing laws to prevent from the Okies from coming in. States would erect billboards on their way to their state saying no jobs in California or simply in big bold letters, keep out. And there was even more extreme measures taken. In the end of 1935 and 1936, California, Florida, and Colorado would set up physical borders and blockades from, to keep people from entering. Florida's trying to do that today. <laughs> Some states even made it a law that bringing poor migrating Americans into their state's borders was illegal. They could physically deport Americans to a neighboring state. Which is weird to me thinking that in an America, an American was not allowed to travel or relocate in America. Reasons why states did this was simple. So many people entering a state for work, when work was already hard to find for its current residents, they didn't want any more competition. Also, if the state had less population, it means more capital to give for state fund relief, more people meant less relief. Plus, I imagine many cities didn't want shanty towns to form, better known at this time period as Hoovervilles. For those who don't know, Hoovervilles are makeshift villages made of mud, scrap metal, or whatever you can find to make a hut. Simply just named at the U.S. president of the time, President A Hoover. lot of things were named after Hoover that people didn't like uh i think also like cardboard became was hoover leather like anything that <laughs> signified that the the country is in the shit was blamed on hoover placed on his his back that's where the hooverville comes from hoover leather there's there's another big one i'm trying to think of if i interrupt here if the okies the people who are suffered from the dust bowl are so poor they and can't travel to certain states legally how do they make it to the new states and cities. Well, you have a straightforward way. Some owned a car and simply packed up all their belongings and drove there. In fact, personal story, that's sort of how my family went from Louisiana to Chicago. My great-grandfather went to Chicago for work. After a time, he told his wife, my great-grandmother, to come and bring the kids to start a new life, in which my great-grandmother drove across the country with four kids, a car with no radio, no AC, a hubcap that would randomly pop off, and no driver's license. Different times. But then you have perhaps the most common and most romanticized one in that days of age. Hitchhiking and railroad cart jumping. From a person who's had to hitchhike once, not fun, I do not recommend, but for these people, they had no choice. Many people who were leaving the Dust Bowl weren't entire families. Many were individuals, single people, majority young men, and kids leaving home not just for money for their families, but food for their bellies. Riding freight trains became a common phenomenon nearly overnight. Sneaking onto empty carts when the trade was in the stockyards or slowly going through town became common. Hey, if you need to get to point A to point B and you have no money, sneaking onto a freight train and riding the rails, it's kind of the best way at the time. The issue of this is it being that it is illegal. It's illegal at riding the trains. It's illegal at riding the trains not buying a ticket. It became so rampant that train companies actually had to start hiring people to kick off illegal train riders. Guards armed with batons throwing people off trains, both moving and stationary, became an everyday occurrence. But for the people risking this, it was worth the risk. They were desperate, and a chance is better than no chance. For example, in a diary, a man at this time named Charlie Bull wrote about his experience and explained that he traveled to Canada to work on a farm, where he worked 13-hour days for $6 a month. And for those wondering, 
$6 in the early 1930s is equivalent to about $100 today. So imagine working anywhere from 260 to 360 hours a month for $100. I guess something's better than nothing. Stories like Charlie and train hopping will go on for many years. People traveling all across America looking for a new beginning. It did not even end with World War II. Many men went off to fight and the industrial military complex picked up. Factories and cities to help the, world, to help the war effort sprung up everywhere which caused a vacuum of many wandering workers or people looking to relocate to the cities. And if the new jobs are opening in Ohio and you live in Oklahoma and you have no money to get to Ohio, the rails are the way. If you're working in a shipyard in California to help the Pacific War Front, you gotta be an Okie. You gotta go from the Midwest to California. It is weird to think ago. It is weird to think about that less than a hundred years ago, Americans were not allowed in certain states People were so poor that children would run away from home to go find work. Let's just hope history does not repeat itself. Well, it's crazy what states people are fleeing from and to. Think about now what states people are fleeing from and to. It's a pendulum. <laughs> it swings one way and it'll come back the other. But yeah, that's an oaky and white trash. I guess, uh, I guess the Midwesterns were a little less creative when they called the Californians flooding nowadays to Midwest and Western countries. We just call them Californians. But with that being said, thank you all for listening. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on Facebook.